Hello and welcome. So here we are today in lecture 17, and we're continuing our uh, work on talking about how to optimize our designs for you know physical implementation with talking about delay. So if you remember, sort of the main metrics for an actual design it was PPA for power performance area. Today it's gonna be that middle one, performance, right? And so there's the notion of what can we do architecturally in terms of you know change the number of cycles something takes. That's one aspect of performance. Today's a little bit more low level talking about what can we do in terms of the actual uh, delays and clock rates them themselves? And then we'll come back to this on Friday and we'll talk about adjusting clock rates deliberately and that sort of thing, uh, continuing with this topic. So uh, let's get into it. So in terms of what we're going to talk about, instead we're talking about delay, where these delays come from, how can we go about reducing them? And then I'm also going to spend time again today's lecture and really take any questions about the project in terms of how you're going to go about that in the next few weeks and remainder of the course. We only have one more homework and one more lab to go beyond what's currently assigned. There'll be one more assigned and then that'll be it. And then the rest will be just the project. So I'll be going over what the project's going to entail. Okay, so let's go ahead and, uh, you know, load in uh, our stuff. Fortunately, we're not going to need a chisel for a while. So I can go ahead and uh, let that run in the background. Um, so let's talk about delay. So perhaps many of you have already taken some of this in uh, some sort of more concrete hardware course, but it's still good to kind of cover our bases and cover our terminology, right? So think about what caused delay. We're talking about, you know, the time it takes from a signal to go from, you know, point A to point B in your design. Uh, there's two types of delays it can experience, right? It can experience delays caused by going through logic gates uh, or from the wires, right? So in this course, normally we've talked about uh, things in terms of operations that make sense to us as humans, you know, and often we're doing things like adding or multiplexing or occasionally we'll do a little bit of discrete logic, but Usually we're kind of working at a higher level, but of course we know under the hood, you know, those adders and multiplexers are built out of logic gates, right? And so those logic gates, you know, is what levels these tools are actually working with and they're actually, you know, synthesizing and placing and routing your design. Um, and that's what we're going to be dealing with, right? So these gates have certain delays and there's all sorts of things that impact uh, the delays on these gates. Um, when you choose a certain technology to implement your design, uh, there may actually be multiple varieties of gate that accomplishes the exact same function, right? Uh, and the reason why, and what may, they may differ by, you know, various area uh, delay trade-offs or even power trade-offs, for example. Um, additionally, gates that have more inputs or just more complicated tend to take longer, right? You know, a two input AND gate is often much easier to implement than let's say like a 10 input AND gate. Actually, most logic libraries don't have a 10 input AND gate. And so that's what you request at the RTL level, which we're reworking all quarter, uh, under the hood, the CAD tools and go ahead and turn that into a few levels of AND gates to get the same behavior. But, you know, does your library have only two input AND gates? Does it also have a three input AND gate? Who knows? And of course, those limitations I'm referring to about two or three inputs kind of being common, that makes sense in the ASIC world. All of a sudden, if you jump to the FPJ world, uh, because of the uh, basic building blocks often are, you know, five, six input gates, there it's actually not a problem to get that many uh, high inputs. Actually, it's better because that way it's fewer gates. So, it's one of those things why it's nice to have your design kind of at a high enough level where it's portable across those domains and really make those tools do the work. Now, when it comes to wire delay, it's not just a matter of getting a signal from point A to point B without going through gates in between. It's also about actually thinking of the wires as not just, you know, perfect networks, but actually appreciating their electrical characteristics, right? So, uh, you know, as a conductor, it has, you know, some amount of, you know, resistance, some amount of capacitance. And so what's going to happen is those are going to impede our ability to actually send a signal. In particular, if you're sending that signal to multiple places, that's going to increase the load that, you know, the amount of stuff that needs to be changed, right? So if I'm sending a wire, it's a very short wire and only to one place, that's obviously very quick. If the wire is very long, that's more wire and more capacitance to, you know, charge and discharge. That's going to take longer. Uh, even if the wire is not that long, if it goes to multiple places, there's some amount of capacitance for each, you know, thing it's driving, for each thing it's changing, that's also going to add to delay. So in terms of terms, you know, we've been saying, okay, yes, we have our gate delay, our wire delay, the number of outputs something goes to, that's the fan out. So the higher the fan out, the more delay you're going to have from having to reach all those things. Um, cool. So then in terms of how these things uh, weigh with each other, it really depends on the design. Remember, when we're talking about things like these delays, these are for a specific design mapped to a specific technology, right? It's not something 
completely intrinsic to your design? No, it depends on how it got mapped technology and how this got put down. Now, if you've only done synthesis, you're only going to have the gate delays. However, once you've done synthesis as well as placement and then routing, you know, that is, you know, you chose which logic components to use, put them down in the placement process, and then connected them with the routing process, um, then you actually get into wire delays, right? And so uh, you can kind of see all these kind of delays add up. And it really depends on your design, how it got mapped, how well these are going to add up. Sometimes maybe your design is going to be largely dominated um, by logic delay. In other cases, especially in FPGAs, you may find your design highly dominated uh, by wire delay, right? Where especially in FPGAs where these wires aren't custom wires, they're you know, preset wires are choosing the route for your particular configuration. There's a lot of things that's kind of going through in between that kind of makes the effective wire delay uh, much longer. Um, but at a big picture, kind of the result to kind of keep in mind here is that just that, you know, when we make our combinational logic, there's just some amount of delay, right? Some amount of delay caused by the logic, some amount of delay caused by the wire, some amount of delay caused by, you know, fanning things out. Cool. Any questions so far? All right. Um, so when it comes to delay, the uh, question is what units are we using to describe it? So usually we're talking about it in terms of units of time. So things like nanoseconds and picoseconds uh, are appropriate, right? Um, and, you know, of course, in the modern era, you know, most when we're talking about individual gate delays. Yeah, usually those are in picoseconds. Remember, we're kind of reminding ourselves, right, that frequency is the inverse of period. So if I have a one gigahertz frequency, clock rate, you know, that's going to be a one nanosecond uh, period. So I'm going to have, if I have a frequency that's greater than one gigahertz, you know, two, three gigahertz, that means my clock period is going to be less than a nanosecond. In other words, in the hundreds of picoseconds range. And since, you know, uh, the signals will have to go through um, multiple levels of logic within one clock period, uh, you know, that kind of gives you a ballpark sense, you know, of, yeah, these gates are talking about tens or hundreds of picoseconds. Uh, for these kinds of delays for high performance design in a leading process. Um, so obviously he's talking about terms of time. You may hear us use these terms that normally we use for length of physical things. You know, I hear things like, oh, it's longer or shorter. But really we're talking about is time is what matters, right? Because it could be the case that maybe you have a very fast path even over a long distance and delay isn't that bad. Or maybe over a very short distance, you do have a big problem with latency because, you know, Maybe the gate's very complicated. Maybe it's a very high fan out, et cetera. So, but when we talk about uh, delays and circuits, we often kind of use this shorter, longer terminology. And we're mostly referring to it in terms of units of time rather than units of distance. Um, one unit I wanted to point out, which you might hear mentioned, it's kind of good to be aware of, is something called FO4. Uh, this is short for fan out of four. Now, what's interesting about this, this is a way to kind of get an appreciation for uh, how long something is kind of in the tech, uh, agnostic way. So what does it represent? It represents the amount of time it takes to um, increase the uh, drive by 4x, right? So in other words, if I have an inverter and that inverter is driving four more inverters, uh, you know, how long does it take for this inverter to charge, right? Because realize this inverter doesn't just driving a single output, it's driving a single output that's going to four other places. Maybe I'll zoom out momentarily so you can see that uh, better in the diagram. Um, so it's got a fan out of four here, right? So it's trying to squeeze all that in there. And so, yeah, so that's going to be um, uh, something to be aware of. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so that's a fan out of four. Now, uh, one thing to be aware of is, you know, yes, yeah, so wait a second, I'm inverting and then I'm inverting again. So in other words, the input here is the same as the output here. So why am I doing this? Well, the reason why you're doing this is you're ramping your way up, right? That, you know, whoever was producing the signal originally only had to drive a single inverter. Now these inverters have, you know, multiplied your effective drive strength, and now you can, you know, drive four inputs or four outputs. If you want to think of it that way, uh, faster, right? So that's why it's kind of a key thing. And so this metric um, came out of this. If you do the analysis for what's the right amount of buffering to kind of get the fan out to get drive large loads, it really depends on technology. But uh, you know, typical best numbers are somewhere in the three to five range in terms of the right amount of fan out to get an optimal buffering. So that's why fan out four is kind of, you know, a commonly used metric. And so for a given technology operating at a certain voltage, uh, there's kind of a notion of what's that delay. And that delay is corresponds to someone doing this experiment. But what's nice about that is then if you later on 
have a delay in terms of actual time units, let's say picoseconds or nanoseconds, and you know what the FO4 delay is, you can divide those two, and now your time is in units of FO4. And what's interesting is um, if you change implementation technologies uh, and you remap design do the same computation again, um, even though the actual times will be very different, right? You know, if I compare something in seven nanometer from today for something 180 nanometer from many years ago, the absolute times are gonna be very, very different. In terms of FO4, they're actually gonna appear very similar, right? And that's kind of the goal. We're kind of getting a good sense of what's going on. And the reason why, of course, is, you know, in today's technology, uh, yes, it's faster absolute terms, but also that, you know, FO4 times gonna be smaller. So that captures it. Meanwhile, for the old technology, Yes, it's very slow, but so is the FO4 times. It's also going to be automatically kind of calibrated or compensated for it. Um, and so with this unit, when we talk about FO4, we're kind of talking about the logic depth of the design. So when someone says, oh, yes, this is a 20 FO4 design, what they're saying is, what's the maximum logic depth for a single clock period? Um, and so it's kind of interesting where if you, for example, as an architect kind of track this uh, for decades, you know, people were kept making shorter and shorter uh, um, or sorry, shallower and shallower designs trying to really get that FO4 down. Um, kind of like the peak might be almost like, you know, the Intel Pentium 4 from now, I guess, gee, uh, probably about 20 years ago. Um, it was down to a 16.3 FO4. Realize prior to that, you know, some circuits, you know, were up to you know, 60, 80 FO4 for a processor. And I believe the contemporary Intel cores are actually probably in the 20 to 30 FO4 range, although I'm not quite sure in the number. Um, and this, you realize what's going on, right? Wait a second. The FO4 is greater than it was historically, and yet the clock period is higher. And the reason why it's possible, of course, is modern technology is faster. Um, and so, yeah, for example, here we're just running some numbers, right? So if I, you know, look up Wikipedia and find out that the Pentium 4 at 3.4 gigahertz has a 16.3 FO4 and that technology was made in, we do a little back in flow math, you know, we figure out what the clock period is by inverting the clock rate. And then from the clock period, we divide that by number of FO4s, we find out that the F of four in that generation is approximately 18 picoseconds, right? And that was, you know, and whatever that was built in, probably 150, 180 nanometer technology. A contemporary technology today, like seven or 10 nanometers, probably gonna have single digit picosecond um, F of four delays. But, whew, okay, a lot of technical stuff there. Let's kind of say a little bit of background for units you might hear mentioned in some of these things. Uh, any questions? Okay, well, let's uh, keep going. Uh oh, no, 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 no. We, we have the binder. We like the binder. <laughs> Don't lose the binder. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, this term has probably come up implicitly. Maybe it's worth me formally defining it, this term of critical path. So what it's referring to is the longest delayed path through a design. In particular, it's the longest delayed path from the output register to the input of another register. Uh, why does that matter? Well, if we're dealing with uh, a synchronous design, which Everything, of course, has been synchronous, uh, unless there was, you know, clockless accommodation at the very beginning. Um, you need to make sure that the inputs to registers are stable before you advance them with the next clock edge, right? And so, um, however long it takes to get from the output of one register to the input, in particular, the longest such path, that's going to set your maximum clock frequency. You may want to run at a slower clock frequency in order to save power. We'll talk about that on Friday. But if you want to go fast, you can't go any faster than your critical path delay. Um, so here, hypothetically, there's a little imaginary uh, circuit uh, of logic gates, and somehow, so we did some analysis, which I'll cover on the next slide, to determine that, yes, that is the uh, longest path in this design. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's going to be the critical path delay. So even though the critical path is the actual path, of course, the delay is going to um, set our frequency. Uh, and what's interesting is actually if paths are shorter in the critical path, we don't worry too much about them, right? Because they aren't going to impact our clock frequency. Um, so if that path can be a little bit longer, as long as it's not longer than a critical path, that's fine. If that path was shorter, also doesn't change your life too much, right? So really all that matters is that critical path and, uh, you know, how long it is. And hopefully we're going to try and shorten that. Now on Friday, I'll briefly mention there's some optimizations some tools can do where if they know a path is definitely not the critical path, they can sometimes, uh, deliberately use slower, uh, logic gates in order to save area or power. Um, but the reason why they're able to do that is because it's not the critical path. And as long as that doesn't become the critical path, they can keep, you know, messing around with it. And then, okay, come for why or how much you figure out the critical path. Uh, one good way for doing this is one of your tools are doing under the hood is something referred to as static timing analysis or STA. 
So what STA is, is a way to, uh, given a design, and this is after your design has already been mapped to technology, to go ahead and look at its time behavior, right? Um, and there's a lot of different types of algorithms that can run, a lot of different metrics or constraints that you be checking. Uh, but let's hypothetically say in this case, you're worried about finding the critical path. In that case, you're trying to find what is the longest delay path in the design. In particular, the longest del delay path from the output register to an input of another register. Um, and uh, you can do this at different times, right? So if you do this only after synthesis, but before you place and route the design, uh, at that point, you only have the delays of the logic gates, but you don't have any delays for the wires, right? Which, uh, you know, if you're a critical path delay after only synthesis is way beyond what you want for your um, uh, target clock period, you got a lot of work ahead of you, right? Because you know that the, the wiring delay is only going to make it worse, right? So uh, you need to get it going. But let's say you manage to get, put that work in and you manage to, you know, optimize your design and the critical path delay after only synthesis is under your clock, target clock period, great. And then now you actually do place and route and you run STA with more information, give it, you know, actual wire delays to work with. And oh my gosh, now you're beyond your target clock period. So you gotta go back to work and fix that up. So um, STA is kind of the process of doing this. Uh, you know, it's not super critical to understand all the details, but you know, just to get a sense of what these algorithms look like, uh, here's an example. And this is courtesy of uh, Martin Schlag and their CSC 100 material. Um, so here we have uh, you know, a variety of logic gates. In green, we have the delays, right? So we have the delays for each of these logic gates, as well as delays for the wires they're traversing, right? And so you know, this is some arbitrary example. So we can see, you know, for example, you know, this AND gate takes four units of time, whatever those units are, versus an AND gate, which is, which is simpler in most circuits, only takes two units of time. These little tiny wire segments take only one unit of time, that's the green, uh, et cetera. And then if we look at the, um, uh, how we might go ahead and analyze this process, right? Well, okay, we have, we're gonna go ahead and compute the input arrival times for logic gates. So for example, we can kind of see, okay, well, if originally these are available at time zero, and they go through one unit of delay. Okay, now it's reached here at time one, this is reached here at time one. Kind of do this process, this one goes through a delay of length five, three, so it's reached here at time three. And then what do we do? Well, then we compute, what time is the output produced by this logic gate? And in this case, we're trying to find a critical path. We're actually kind of worrying about the worst case, right? So uh, we're taking the max of our two inputs. In this case, they both come at the same time. And then we add a lot, the gate delay onto it. Okay, so the max of one and one is one. Add four onto it. Okay, so the output here is available at time five. Cool. And then, okay, so you have this signal is available at time five. This signal is available at time zero, right? It goes through three units of delay to get here. It goes through five units of delay to get here, so the result, this is gonna arrive later. It's gonna arrive at time 10. This is gonna arrive at time three. So for example, we're trying to compute the output time here. We take the max of these two, the 10, add the logic delay on, okay, that's 12. Oh, sorry, get delayed for two and get the output arrival at time is two, uh, 12. Keep going to finally get this, right? So this is our final output uh, time. That's our critical path delay. Um, and it's important to appreciate a certain amount of pessimism to this, right? It could be the case that, you know, for example, maybe this, path is longer, but if, for example, if this input doesn't actually change, uh, then maybe that corner case won't be you know, exercised, right? And so, so STA is really kind of about, you know, thinking about things kind of in the worst case and really kind of covering your bases. Um, there are more sophisticated analyses, such as dynamic time analysis, which actually considers what can actually happen in practice with, with you know, data and see if there's any kind of, you know, data dependent behaviors. Additionally, some STA tools may also have more information uh, for each of these models, right? Rather having a simple model, which is a single delay, it may have delay parameterized by certain operating conditions or input transition directions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and going back to the algorithm, once we have our critical path delay, because we actually want to find the critical path, we can work way backwards, right? Okay, so which of these arrives latest? Okay, this one arrives later. Okay, we go here. Which of these arrives later? Uh, this arrives later. Okay, we go here, and then boom, we have it. And that's how we get the uh, thing on the prior slide. Uh, but cool, so that's going on under the hood in these tools, this kind of timing analysis. So when you are working with a design and you're trying to, uh, you know, optimize or understand it, you know, the tools are going to give you that kind of initial number about the stack timing analysis. They're just trying to give you a quick check to make sure your time is going to pass. In other words, your clock period you're targeting is going to be possible. And like I said, sometimes if you're running STA in a very lightweight sense after only synthesis, it's really just the gate delays. Um, and you know, if you're not clearing that 
clock period, there's no point in worrying about placing and routing. Placing and routing takes a lot of time, so save yourself the trouble. But if you are able to clear your target clock period at that point, then you need to worry about uh, then placing and routing to see if you still meet your clock period. Cool. Uh, questions so far? All right. Uh, it appears my video froze. I'm going to go ahead and see if I can't tweak that real quick. Um, that might be fixed. Cool, that did work. Great, um, let's continue. So let's say you've gone through this process and you've done a backend level math and you know that your design in order to reach a certain desired performance, you need to have a certain uh, clock period. Uh, and unfortunately for your target technology, you know, you run through the tools and you found you were not there. So what you need to do is you need to go ahead and fix uh, those critical paths, right? That there's those paths are longer in your talk clock period, longer as in terms of delay, of course, and we need to somehow optimize them to make them take less time. Um, so this is kind of a hypothetical overview of what might happen. So if you look at all of the paths in your design, right? So this is coming from your static timing analysis tool and you make a histogram. So this, you know, this is, you know, perhaps maybe a bunch of, bunch of bars rather than a line. This is kind of an artist's impression by me. Okay, so number of paths and how long it takes. So most paths are pretty short, right? Uh, maybe there's some, you know, very unusual corner case with like a straight wire registered register, but a lot of paths are, you know, pretty short. And there's kind of this long tail of path length, right? And so it turns out, you know, that a handful of paths uh, that are beyond your target period, those are the ones that are really going to kind of get you in trouble. So, you know, uh, if these paths are in your design, uh, you need to make your period longer, right? But that's, that's not what you're going to want, right? You're going to want to uh, somehow get these paths to have a delay less than this line. Right, so uh, what do you want to do? Well, uh, you're going to need to go in, optimize those paths. We're going to talk about some techniques in the next few slides. And what's going to happen is you optimize those paths. You're going to take that one path. You're somehow, with all these tricks and optimizations, get it to be shorter in terms of delay. Great. You're going to keep doing that until you get it lowered in your target period. Fantastic. Great. And then what do you do? Then you do the next path that's longer than your critical path. And so you keep tacking your critical path. So what's the longest path? Okay, do that one. Hopefully get the delay over here somewhere. Then do the next longest one. Gets delay, hopefully over here somewhere. You keep doing this process. And after doing this process, you might have uh, you know, a slight spike uh, of paths at your critical path, right? Sorry, at your target uh, period, right? Because you went through these Herculean efforts to kind of get below that period. Hopefully, you're, there's no point in going out of your way to overshoot that. As long as you get below it, you're happy. Um, and kind of what happens is, uh, as there's more and more paths kind of accumulating at just below your target period, uh, it kind of makes a lot of inertia in your design for you to go improve this later on, right? Where um, let's say you make a design one year and this is your target period and you're great. And then your manager comes to you next year and says, hey, uh, without change technology, we want to increase your clock frequency by 10%. And you're like, oh my gosh, right? Because you just know how hard it was to get all of your paths to this side of the line. And now you want to move it over by 10%. It's going to be hard, right? Because you've actually, there's a lot of paths already in this regime, right? Before it was kind of a very thin, long tail, and you've just kind of fattened it up by all these paths you've optimized, right? And um, understand this path optimization is done by, not just by you, but also by tools or even the two of you working together, right? So even in a generic synthesis placing and routing process, um, you give it a target period, right? And it's going to recognize that some paths are beyond that period. The tools are going to try their best to fix those uh, paths, right? So they can do various things like, you know, using those faster gates we talked about earlier, perhaps a rerouting and replacing those components to be closer to each other to try and reduce that wire delay. There's a few things they can do in the tools automatically, but in spite of that, you know, there's still some paths too long. That's where you do human come in. And so this is a very time consuming process where you have to go in and look at your current most critical path, just wrap your head around where it's going. You're gonna be given by tools or report, you know, it says, okay, well, the path that starts at this register output going to this register input takes this many, you know, time units, and that's too long, and here's, you know, the 25 things it goes to in between. Now, when you first start this process, maybe there's some egregious critical paths. You're like, oh, you're kind of laughing. I know what that is. I can go ahead and fix that. But, you know, after doing this for a long time, the paths really get pretty hard to find. Uh, the distribution is getting fatter, so there's more paths to change in order to get, an, you know, an appreciable decrease in critical path. Uh, and the, flute, the fixes aren't quite so obvious. Sometimes for some very you know, egregious critical path violations, you have a pretty good idea what you can do, but sometimes after you've done this already a few times, there's not much low-hanging fruit, right? It's a lot of more hard work to kind of squeeze it out of it. And so 
at some point there's kind of this you know convergence of uh, how much you want to improve your critical path versus how much effort you're willing to put into it. At some point, those lines cross and you're, you're kind of done, right? <laughs> um, but you're right. Okay, so that's kind of a high-level overview of what kind of this process is like. Um, maybe I'll pause for any questions here. Uh, okay, cool. Um, let's uh, keep going. So, um, how are we going to go about actually fixing those critical paths? Um, one such trick uh, is pipelining, right? So you may remember this from your architecture courses or your digital design courses. And that is um, to insert registers in your design to reduce the amount of logic the single need goes, needs to go through in one clock period, right? So for example, in our original design, we had this long combinational path. We had to go through a lot of logic. I'm not even bothering drawing individual gates. And that set our critical path, right? From the output of one register to the input of every register, um, that longest path delay in our entire design is going to be our critical path, right? And so what can we do? Well, if somehow we're able to put a register in the middle of that, uh, we now can shorten that path, right? It's going to go through less logic, less wires. So great, we shorten our critical path, right? Um, now what's the catch, right? The catch is uh, by, you know, instant registers the pipeline, uh, it needs to be possible, right? So sometimes due to the topology uh, in here, it's not always easy to kind of put a register in there the way you would like. Um, uh, another issue is that now that I've put this register in here, I have slightly changed the semantics of the circuit, right? The output comes out one cycle later. Additionally, I now have, you know, two things in flight at a time, right? I have one bit of data working on it here, one bit of data working on it here. For this here, I had only one thing at a time. So if I had a feedback path, perhaps for example, maybe looping back around or something, that might not be okay to have two in flight if they're dependent on each other. Uh, but usually there's that parallelism where you have multiple things in flight, and so it's okay to kind of toss this in there. Um, if some of you are perhaps, you know, uh, grimacing from memories of pipelining in the architecture course, remember that uh, a processor is almost like the hardest case, right? Where uh, our ISAs, you know, are very sequential in nature, and as a result, you know, there frequently are dependencies between, you know, consecutive instructions in a processor, and so it's really kind of make it hard to do a lot of this stuff. If you instead look at more arbitrary harder blocks, like the ones we've done in this course or other things, they tend to uh, have a lot more parallels and kind of intrinsic to the workload, and so sometimes it's much easier to kind of handle these issues. Um, but still, the, the idea is kind of the same here with pipeline, of course, you know, what we're doing is we're inserting registers to, uh, you know, break up these long combinational uh, paths, right? And, you know, where do you want to put it? Well, you want to kind of balance the delay. So here I've shown you maybe want to have it perfectly evenly balanced. It turns out it may not matter so much if somewhere else in the design there's a, you know, a path equivalent to, let's say, 75% the length of this path. Because, you know, as long as this is, you know, within that 75% or one, each of these are less than 75%, you're fine, right? So it's going to be dictated by the critical path. But, you know, all things being equal, you'd prefer it to be equal. That way it's, uh, you know, balance starts to stay balanced. That way, you know, you're going to balance the delays. Um, now, if you look at your design, sometimes it's very clear where a good place to put a register is. Okay, yes, I have, you know, this module here. Uh, and if you use the center module, I just toss a register right between them at the boundary. That makes sense. Or maybe this module register represents something that makes sense to you semantically. Uh, other times, um, where the register needs to go in order to have the best delay may not make sense. And it's going to be very technology dependent, right? Because, you know, for, for example, one time you map your design to one technology, you have certain behaviors, and then you map to another technology. It's not even just the technology, it's also the way the tools happen to choose to synthesize certain blocks and how they chose to place them and route them. It's gonna change those delays, right? So this is part of why I was encouraging so much all quarter for us to worry about getting the design working, getting it functionally correct, and then postponing that optimization for later because uh, those optimizations are gonna be very dependent on what you're targeting, right? And so we want to kind of postpone that work to make sure we're doing it right when we need it. Um, and so, yeah, so, you know, when you're making your design, you're definitely in some cases where for functional purposes, you're going to need to have registers, right? You need to hold the value of a count if you have a counter, right? You need to have something to hold that. Um, however, additional registers inserted for clock period reasons for reducing critical path for pipelining, you may need those too. Uh, but where is the best place to put those? So like I said, sometimes it may be obvious, sometimes you may need to put more work to it. And um, to know if it's worth putting into work, you need to run it through the tools see where your critical path is and see uh, if that's something you can fix with pipelining and also kind of assess, you know, um, is that performance necessary?
Because if it's not necessary and you meet your timing, you're done. No reason to spend unwasted effort, right? Unneeded effort. Cool. Uh, okay. Um, I'm going to keep pausing if there's any more questions. So for pipelining, I think it's you know, a concept that seems pretty reasonable. But instead, the kind of question is where do you put the registers? Um, in the spirit of making tools do the work, there's actually a pretty nice innovation from now, I guess, decades ago. Uh, that's become quite commonplace in a lot of CAD tools called retiming or register retiming is more, uh, you know, full way of describing it. And so what that is, is it's the CAD tools uh, nudging those registers back and forth uh, for you to try and balance those latencies out, right? Where if the tools are able to uh, recognize what the critical path is and recognize the registers and recognize that some of these registers are movable, like that is they can move it forwards or backwards through the logic and not change its semantics from the outside, um, then it's able to do this, right? And so it's actually pretty neat. Uh, that's able to kind of do this force often automatically. It's able to save a lot of human effort, right? Where if we have enough registers in design, they're going to worry about balancing it. Now, what are some challenges? Well, number one, as I said, sometimes a register is kind of fixed, it's immovable, right? Because uh, there's a feedback path. For example, that counter example is that feedback, you know, from the count plus one going back and the outputs, you know, the count, and you add one to that to go back into the input. Um, that's going to be, you know, a feedback path. And so it can't just move it arbitrarily, right? Because there's, there's two, there's kind of in that type feedback. Um, but a lot of other registers, you're going to be able to move. Uh, and then that's what the tools are going to do. Now, in terms of how it works under the hood, uh, there's different types of retiming algorithms, how they kind of choose which registers to move where. A lot of the algorithms kind of tend to like to just move all the registers and then kind of space them back in, rather than just moving the ones they need to, they kind of like to kind of start from the ground up. And so some tools prefer to have all the registers at the end and then move them uh, to the, at the outputs and then move them uh, backwards towards uh, the uh, inputs. That's referred to as backwards retiming. Other tools like all the registers at the inputs and then they push them towards the outputs and that's called forward retiming, the moving those forward. Um, it, it varies in the tool. Um, it's one of these things where uh, if you're in a situation where you're worried about clock period and you have a tool that supports retiming, definitely try to make sure that feature is turned on and try to understand you know, what that particular CAD tool needs, right? And whatever that CAD tool needs, you should jump through those hoops because if the tool is going to be retiming for you, that's going to be a lot less effort than you manually uh, balancing those clock uh, paths, those, 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 those paths for the critical period, sorry, for the critical path for the improving your clock period. Um, and then so you've seen this example, for example, we had, you know, an extra register here at the output. And so the tools are able to identify, you can push that forward. Um, you can imagine all sorts of scenarios. Uh, one challenge of retiming is because you're moving registers around, um, now the contents of registers semantically are different, right? So if you're, depending on how you're doing various testing or verification, uh, things, um, that's going to be harder. Fortunately, since retiming has been around for a few years now, uh, a lot of the tools have learned how to um, compensate for this or adjust for this, right? But that's also part of the complexity of retiming. It isn't just a matter of balancing these paths and identifying when you're allowed to move a register, but also um, making the other stuff kind of work with that correctly, right? For example, you know, if you as a human, uh, you know, are working at design and it retimes under the hood and then you simulate it, uh, you know, those registers in the waveform would be different than ones you expected. So that's why it's good, for example, to get your FUD design functionally correct before you were about optimizing it, before you were about retiming, just get it working at the RTL level. And once it's functionally correct, then you hopefully you can trust the retiming to not introduce any bugs. But of course, that's something you need to test. Whew. Cool. Uh, any questions on retiming or pipelining? Yeah, so, so the question from chat was, uh, this seems like a really hard optimization problem. Uh, how optimal is this going to turn out? Um, definitely the word optimal I would avoid in this case. Yeah, it's definitely heuristic. <laughs> um, understand that it's partly because it's like unknowable in some way. And the reason why it's unknowable is realize when you uh, move these registers around, you are changing the delays, <laughs> right? And so... Um, 
when you move a register around in the design, uh, you know, at a minimum, you need to move the wires around. But if you actually want to get the most out of it, you're probably also going to adjust the, you know, remove the wires means you know, rerouting the wires. At a minimum, you're probably also going to want to um, replace the components to be near each other and take advantage of that. So uh, you're, you're, you're going to make a change, and then it's going to have a change uh, in terms of how it actually manifests itself. In terms of how it's implemented, my understanding is a lot of them are uh, phrased as an integer linear program or even a mixed integer linear program. Um, that's not a kind of looking under the hood, but I mean, that's just, you know, me as, from far away as naive impression of how these are phrased. Um, you know, if we know, perhaps the most sophisticated retiming algorithms are a little bit different in actuality. But yes, it's definitely a heuristic driven process. You know, you phrase it as an ILP, an integer linear program, gives you some chance of making it optimal for those conditions. But like I said, the reason why it's not, you know, globally optimal is who knows if the changes you make from retiming, you know, change the delays and then you should run it again. Um, additionally, who knows, you know, if for the design, you know, if you chose to use different logic gates in the earlier synthesis, or if you chose to place things differently and some of the wire delays are intrinsically different, um, it would be a different, you know, trajectory you'd be on. So yeah, when it comes to, you know, practical hardware construction, it's rarely optimal. Uh, sometimes it's locally optimal or, you know, uh, or, or maximal if you want to think of it that way, but uh, global is really hard to achieve. But yeah, it's definitely a complicated algorithm. Um, I was talking about this earlier with someone else today where, uh, you know, Vivado's uh, Xilinx is common um, FPGA CAD tool. Uh, so in, that tool encompasses, you know, synthesis, placement, and routing on FPGA. And, you know, the predecessor of that tool, ICE, uh, had retiming in it, and it was great. And then as a grad student, I was working on a project and we realized we needed retiming. And at that time, Vivado uh, did not support retiming, right? Because same kind of thing where, you know, they did a large rewrite of their code bases and the earlier version, and for this new code base, they, you know, trimmed down the features as they're kind of re-implementing them. And so at that time, originally there was no retiming. Then they put in some retiming, which they claimed was only backwards retiming or something. And hopefully now years later, it's, you know, full robust retiming again. Um, that'd be really nice for everyone. Uh, but yeah, so that's kind of a sense. So it's definitely a tricky thing. Um, I'm not familiar with too many open source tools that do this. Uh, maybe some do. Um, it's usually something that's kind of the fancy uh, commercial tools do. Uh, even though I believe the original uh, retiming tool was a research open source product. But yeah, I'll, I'll be corrected in chat if someone else uh, remembers this better. <laughs> Okay, well then, uh, so that's uh, retiming. Um, so how does that come back to us, right? So like I said, um, you know, normally we have pick a target clock period for our design, see how it goes. If we're well under uh, the target clock period, we're done. We can just go home early, right? But if it turns out, you know, after a synthesis, we're not making a target clock period, then we need to do things like perhaps um, maybe uh, doing some pipelining. And then if we're unsure where to put registers, we can do the retime, which we'll talk about in just a second. Um, that's what we're talking about now, I should say. So for the retiming, the easiest way to do it is to kind of just put those extra registers in your design, right? And like I said, we want these registers to not have, you know, tight feedback paths. We want them to be, you know, registers from the output of one seeing its input of the next, kind of like a shift register, right? Just bang, 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 bang. And so it's actually not too hard to do this in Chisel, right? We can basically use this pipe construct, which is, you know, built into chisel.util, which, you know, you give it uh, a data type and, um, uh, a depth and it instantiates that register is kind of connected in that shift register formation. Uh, unlike, you know, a proper shift register, there's no kind of shift control. It's just always feeding it forward, uh, which is good because that way, you know, there's no dependence paths that are going to prevent us from being retimed. And just go ahead and kind of insert that in after logic. So we have a hypothetical uh, module here, and we're trying to pipeline its depth, so take a parameter for our depth. And, you know, there's some IO and with all the logic of this module to put these registers at the end, we're simply just gonna wrap the result that was, oops, we're gonna wrap that result that was produced by the combinational logic inside this pipe and then, you know, give it the depth and it's gonna put that many registers there. And then um, hopefully the uh, combinational, uh, sorry, the uh, CAD tools you're working with can then retime those appropriately. Um, you may find out for the CAD tools you're working with, they're finicky about where they want those extra registers, in which case maybe you need to put them uh, all at the front, in which case you need to put them on the inputs rather than the outputs. One interesting thing that happens with retiming, which I guess I can't really show with this diagram, is as you're moving uh, registers through combinational logic back and forth, what was one register might turn into multiple registers, right? For example, 
it registers on the output of the adder, and you move it forward to the other side of the adder, then you're going to have two registers, right? One for each input, right? And so um, as you kind of move these uh, registers forward and backwards through your logic, you may be increasing or decreasing the number of registers. Um, and so, yeah, so in this case, you know, uh, we, depending on how we put this initial stack registers for our pipe, it's going to be one place, but understand that the CAD tools when it's doing read timing is going to move us around on its own. Um, so cool. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of a neat thing um, to kind of see that in practice. Uh, and you can go find this in a lot of designs that are being optimized. You may find people are kind of under mass of the configurations. You may find they have you no know, parameters for latency or, um, uh, you know, uh, a depth. And you may wonder why would somebody ever want to have a high latency and low latency sound good? Well, when it comes to clock period, uh, you want to make sure this module is not the critical path, right? So sometimes you want to turn that latency up uh, in order to get more registers down here. And that's through shortening the critical path. So even though it takes more cycles to get through that unit, you know it's going to part of the critical path. And then this is a parameter, it's a knob, right? Because who knows, depending on what other things you're mixing this component with in your design or what technology you're mapping to, how it's mapping so far, what the right number is going to be. Cool. Uh, questions so far? Retiming is done by your CAD tool. So uh, if you look at the Verilog that's produced by this, it's going to just be um, registers feeding to each other. Um, you know what? I think, uh, okay, that's not a code pane. Okay, I forgot. This is a text pane. If there's time, I come back to this and actually try and do a quick demo. We look at the Verilog. Basically, you're, you're going to see that it's register feeding and register feeding and register is what the Verilog is produced. Um, and, and then the CAD tool has to go figure that out. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, yeah, how does it do that yet? Yeah. So yeah, we don't do retiming in Chisel. That's something that we just give it that flexibility by putting those registers in there, right? Because the point is that these CAD tools, you know, much like compilers are kind of, you know, obliged to um, deliver the same external semantic behavior, right? So if I have a module which, um, you know, has an output coming after out after one cycle, if this CAD tool, you know, recognizes that as a critical path and puts in four registers for me, uh, great, it may fix the critical path, but now that thing takes four cycles to produce a result. Um, so yeah, that's 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 not the same semantic behavior. And so us, by putting in this pipe module, which puts in those extra registers for us, um, we're giving it that semantic you know leeway to do it, right? Now, perhaps maybe they'll take a moment here to kind of pause and appreciate. This is kind of a, uh, I guess the motivation for a lot of alternative uh, languages where, uh, you know, people want to hear about Chisel and they hear about Scala, they think, oh, it's a high-level synthesis. It's actually not high-level synthesis, right? We are describing every last, you know, register and wire and gate we're using. It's just we have the full power of Scala while we're doing this to make these generators, right? So perhaps a better analogy isn't so much a magic synthesis. It's more of just, we're like, metaprogramming, right? So for those familiar with Plus, you know, template metaprogramming, where you think about your program both in terms of how it runs when it's actually executing, as well as what the compiler is doing when it's producing your program. That's kind of what we're doing here with Chisel, right? Where you are... Uh, thinking about both the hardware circuit you want to construct as well as the Scala program that's going to generate that topology for that hardware circuit you're constructing, right? And so um, both Chisel as well as a classic language is cycle accurate, like, you know, Verilog, et cetera. Uh, those are cycle accurate, right? So you're saying, you know, on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle behavior, what exactly is happening on every signal, right? Uh, and so with that tight constraints, that really limits what uh, tools can do. So some of these other languages that are kind of a little more flexible they focus more on the semantic uh, behavior, sorry, more on the functional behavior, I should say, and the timing is more relaxed, right? And then the timing is kind of something that gives the tools the op freedom to go ahead and pipeline or retime how it wants, right? Now, retiming is free in the sense that it doesn't change the semantic behavior on externally. It does change the contents register as you go peek inside the design, right? So if you go peek in design for verification or for debugging in a waveform, yeah, those are gonna be different. But on the outside, it shouldn't change anything. However, is there languages, like I said, something like, you know, for example, the work of my uh, colleague, Jose Renau, in his Pyrope language, or you may find something online called TL Verilog. Uh, those ones are much more flexible to timing behavior, and thus the tools kind of do more automatically. Um, there's trade-offs. I suspect in the future, it's my own personal opinion now, uh, that I think there'll be kind of room for these uh, timing flexible languages as well as these timing specific languages, kind of much like how today uh, in software, we have lots of stuff written in high-level languages that are, you know, 
fun, easy to get going, like Python or JavaScript, and a lot of code written in a local efficiency language like C++, right? And so I think there's something similar in hardware. Perhaps there might be a future where um, we will have these high-level languages where you kind of write things this tiny agnostic way, and perhaps even connecting together libraries or generators that internally are very much timing specific in little languages like Chisel, Verilog, System Verilog, et cetera. But yeah, great question. Sorry, I kind of led to a good conversation. <laughs> cool. So yeah, so uh, yeah, let me just kind of pause and remind what we're doing here, right? So we were worried about delays. Um, number one, run tools to make sure delay is a problem. And if it is, you go ahead and pipeline. Uh, and uh, to figure out where to put this register, sometimes you can figure it out on your own pretty clearly. Uh, other times, um, uh, you know, you can let the tools do with retiming, right? And uh, like I said, the, the, this is where so much time goes into commercial designs, right? Where they're really pushing hard on that frequency thing because realize if you're able to increase the frequency of your design, that's almost like free performance, right? Assuming there's no bubbles induced by pipelining, uh, as you increase the frequency, you get more done per unit area. Now it's gonna take more power to do that. There may also be some energy efficiency implications. We'll cover those on Friday. But, you know, if you have one component running at one clock rate, uh, and then if you run um, a component at twice the clock rate, that's twice as much work getting done, assuming there's no bubbles, right? So in other words, that's like half the area would have been if you had to have two of those components to try and catch up. So there's plenty of motivation to chase clock rate, but there's obviously some uh, limitations. For processor design teams, it's so painful because there's so many feedback, independence, you know, dependence paths, whether it be, you know, updating certain state elements, uh, forwarding, those sorts of things are really complicated. But for arbitrary logic, especially like an accelerator, sometimes it's a lot more perils and a lot easier to deal with. So it's actually processors are kind of the worst case. That's part of why, you know, for this course, we deliberately decided not to do processors and leave that for the domain of 125, 225 uh, to kind of keep those separate. Cool. All right. Um, so another thing you might do to improve the uh, logic behavior uh, is to recognize if you have a really deep combinational path, right? So sometimes a deep combinational path is your fault, right? It's not the, the tools being silly. It's like, oh, wait, I have something, uh, you know, that's just a really deep path, right? And like I said, so the tools can't change the real behavior. So if, it, if it's something they can't do to do it, um, logic optimization, I would say, is a very solved problem. I mean, obviously, some people may disagree with that, but like a lot of this work was done in the 70s, 80s in terms of automating CAD tools. They're still being modified today to this day, but um, the fact that these tools and these audio algorithms are kind of developed back then kind of shows how this is a very mature problem people are very good at. Um, and so simplifying uh, logic and optimizing logic, they're really good at. But like I said, sometimes, you know, in order to provide the same type of behavior, you kind of back these tools in the corner and they, they can't get themselves out of it, right? And so uh, what might happen? Well, sometimes if we're too fancy for our generators, we might actually make something that grows linearly. And by linearly, I mean linearly in depth. Linear and area consumption, of course, isn't so bad. That might be reasonable for some problems. But in terms of logic depth, in terms of how deep it goes from, you know, I mean, FO4 is my going through equivalent, that's the thing to be concerned about, right? And so sometimes, um, you, instead of building things linearly, you might be do shallower, you know, reduce that depth by doing it as a tree. And depending on the nature of your tree and the problem, maybe the tree is more area. It actually may be the same area or less area. And it's just a little more complicated to implement, but, you know, perhaps it's worth it. Um, and so like I said, so before you uh, go about doing this, you should always, you know, ensure it's the critical path first. And, you know, uh, convince yourself this is the problem, this is how you go ahead and fix it, right? And that even if it's linear, I've shown you plenty of examples of linear generators in this course. If n is small and it's not the critical path, that's fine. It's simple, it works. It's something that's easier to understand, that's great. Um, other times, when you have something that looks like a simple linear generator, understand the CAD tools. Said, these logic optimizers are really smart. So they're gonna look at that thing and recognize, oh wait, here's what you're doing, I got this. And it'll turn into a tree for you, right? Um, so once again, don't optimize until you know you need to, right? So measure it, make sure you need it, and convince yourself you can go and fix it. If you go spend all this time trying to reduce your depth before you know it's a critical path, that's kind of wasted effort. All right, so let's go see an example of that. So remember earlier in the quarter, we showed just like reduction, right? We were we wanted to add up n numbers, right? And so we did a you know recursive function that you know called itself and it called uh, you know n times. And so uh, technically with n minus one adders we need in order to build this, right? And that's a really deep logic depth, right? As I want to add up more numbers, the the depth is growing linearly, right? Uh, alternatively, if I just as a tree reduction, right? Um, you know the depth is going to be logarithmic, 
And the number of adders actually is not going to be any worse, right? Because, you know, yes, I'll have n over two adders here, then n over four adders here, and then n over, you know, eight adders. So if I keep adding up half of what's left, you know, the limit, of course, is going to be uh, like Zeno's paradox, you know, not quite one, right? So um, it's, it's actually not going to be any more area, right? Um, but, you know, perhaps implementing this is a little more complex than we want to deal with the first time you write a module. And until we know this is actually a bottleneck, it's not worth it. Especially, for example, maybe if, you know, n is typically, you know, one or two, you know, is it really worth going through all this and worrying these corner cases, right? Maybe not. So actually seeing this in, in Scala, or should I say Chisel, and only by now the libraries are lighter than. Let's see what we want to do this pop count problem. So what's pop count? Pop count's counting how many ones are high in a number, right? We did that maybe in Game of Life. Uh, and I chose this problem with risky just adding up, uh, you know, a vector of inputs. And if they were arbitrary numbers, it would be, you know, a reduction. But here, because we're adding up, you know, single bit things, it's kind of like pop count. Okay, so we want to count number of ones. So perhaps, like something some we did earlier in the quarter, we might write like this. Or I might say, hey, let's, you know, uh, do this recursively. Uh, if uh, I have anything more to add up, I can shat that as zero. Otherwise, I'm recursively, you know, add up my contents plus the remainder, right? And so if we go ahead and uh, look at what this output looks like, hopefully uh, it works. Um, actually may not work because I guess we lost that connection to the uh, binder instance, but good news, we can at least present. <laughs> and you can try this out uh, when you get back. But um, let's talk about what we might see. What we're going to see, of course, is, you know, for example, for step of four, we're going to see, uh, you know, uh, four different additions. Or I should say three additions and one of them is adding on to zero, right? But we're going to see that grow linearly. Now, if we did it as a tree, and this is, you know, the algorithm basically taken from the chisel itself for its own pop count, um, what do you do? Well, it's still a recursive algorithm. We're still dividing and conquering. But rather than taking off one at a time, we're taking off half at a time, right? So we're saying half this way, half that way. So take and drop are Scala built-in things on seeks that, you know, are ways to kind of, you know, divvy the collection up. And... Um, so as a result, you can see, okay, we're going to, you know, forget these base cases of, you know, there's nothing left. We we'll add zero. If there's only one thing left, okay, that's just me. But then if I have a lot more left, I go ahead and divide it in half, right? And so this is going to produce that logarithmic depth tree. So if you run this Verilog, you would see that. And then um, additionally, you also could uh, look at the um, uh, implementation from, uh, the results are from built-in pop count, which is going to be the same as the tree pop effectively. Cool. So... Like I said, this is one of these things where this is an authorization you have up your sleeve. You can, you know, deploy this when you know you need it. We don't necessarily need to do this on day one, right? But when you know you need this and you have something that's kind of growing and you have one of these generators that's very parameterized, maybe you want to use one of these trees, for example. Cool. Uh, other questions? Okay, well, if there's no more questions on the content, I'm gonna go and jump into the project. Um, so, as we kind of mentioned, the goal for this project is to kind of give you a chance to really, you know, employ what you've learned, right? As well as learn more while doing the project, right? So what are we talking about? We're talking about you and a partner. If you really wanna work alone, you can work alone, but I recommend working with a partner. Uh, you're gonna design a generator, right? So you're gonna pick some sort of problem that, oh, I like to build a generator that does X. Uh, and then you're gonna go ahead and do it. So what's that going to involve? There's, there's actually got a lot of steps. And so uh, it's kind of nice part of this project is even though there's only a few weeks left in the quarter, uh, by now you're all quite proficient at, you know, writing up chisel and that sort of stuff. Uh, these projects aren't going to be gigantic in terms of what the generator is going to be, right? In terms of if you ask me how big the generator should be, I mean, hand wavy, right? It's going to vary on your problem. But, you know, we're saying maybe approximately maybe like 1.5 times the size of one of these more recent homework problems we've been doing. But realize, of course, when you do homework problems, uh, this is after the staff has provided you a lot of scaffolding, right? We've done a lot of work to define the problem. We've done a lot of work to give you starter code and often test cases uh, to help get you going, right? Uh, as well as when it's come time for you to check your work, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are perhaps taking advantage of running the auto grader and seeing how that goes and kind of doing that. So there's kind of a lot of scaffolding and help. For this project, you're on your own. So it's kind of up to you to... Um, Get your own first initial thing running, close it by yourself initially, get your own first test cases, and then keep building more test cases, more features, more optimizations, and revising it, right? So over the course of this project, you may have an idea going in, I'm doing X, and you may find, you know, you have to keep revising that, and by the end, you're doing, like, X2, something a little different, right? You're 
kind of adjusting with what's happening. Maybe going in, is this certain optimization you're really worried about doing? Oh yeah, I'm gonna need to do this, optimize this other resource consumption. And then it turns out that, you know what? It actually wasn't a problem, right? And so uh, there's kind of a lot of steps. And so we're kind of focusing more on the entire process um, rather than having a super, super, super gigantic uh, project that's something you produce, right? Because there's a lot of steps this process, right? You're gonna propose it, design it, develop it, test it, optimize it, revise it, you know, document and present, right? So there's, there's a lot of steps. Um, in terms of picking the, the idea, um, we encourage you to pick your own, uh, but it's a two-way conversation. So I'm gonna ask you to turn in a proposal next week, but you know, that's not set in stone. We can revise from there. It can be a conversation with the staff. I encourage you to come talk to the staff this week. Uh, maybe talk, bounce an idea off us early if you wanna get early feedback in office hours, or ask us, you know what? Hey, I'm completely stumped. I have no idea. Can you suggest something? Yes, yes, we can suggest uh, uh, things. And so for example, uh, Jason has just volunteered on uh, the chat. You know, he has his office hours as always following today's lecture. And yeah, he'll be available to talk about if you have any, um, he has projects <laughs> in mind. We talked about this today earlier. And so, yeah, we have, we have projects in mind if you don't have ideas on your own. Um, maybe I'll go forward and then come back so there's more kind of follow-up questions, right? So what's the rough timeline? So we're in week six of a 10-week quarter. So right now, it's just kind of just, you know, getting, getting out there, right? Find a partner if you haven't found one already. Think of what idea you might want to work on, right? Next week, you're going to propose a project. Uh, the proposal is going to be like a, a one-page write-up, less than one-page write-up. You're going to submit that, and you're going to get feedback from the instructors, and you're actually going to meet during class time. So we're going to have lectures today, Friday, and Monday, and then Wednesday, Friday, next week, we're actually going to be reserved for meeting uh, with groups uh, so that we can kind of you know get more guaranteed time with groups and the instructor. That's not the only time you should meet the instructor. If you can come by office hours and talk about things as well, that's also great. Um, but that's just we want to make sure we also reserve some class time in order to really make sure we kind of cross those bases. And then, um, okay, so week seven, you propose, get some initial feedback. Uh, week eight, you really try and get going, right? Close that loop, get the initial small thing working, get some small test cases running and kind of start building your way up, right? And then keep going, right? Don't stop there, right? Keep adding more features, keep making better test cases, keep going from there. Um, and uh, week nine, you're gonna be kind of Hopefully by then you're nearly feature complete. Doesn't mean you're done, but it means you're done building what you hope to build originally. And you can start worrying about, okay, you know what? After I've built this, maybe I wanna refactor this code, change this interface, uh, optimize this other thing, et cetera. Um, and then uh, in week 10, uh, the last week of instruction, uh, you're gonna go ahead and um, finalize your, your project uh, and present it to your colleagues. Now, um, uh, in the coming weeks, we'll also have a few guest lectures. The last one of them is being confirmed, the other one's picking a date, but we'll have you know uh, probably two, if not three, guest lectures uh, in the coming weeks as well. So that's gonna kind of be spreading out. So we really covered a lot of the content, especially after Friday and Monday for this course in terms of the lecture material, and then there'll be more about what you're gonna learn from the project by doing, uh, as well as from our wonderful guest speakers. Um, give you a little bit more meat onto what we're talking about. Uh, so in terms of what you can deliver for this project, like I said, by class time, uh, next week on Wednesday, we're gonna need a proposal. And so for the first group going right away at the beginning of class time on Wednesday, yeah, I'm gonna read a proposal in front of you if you haven't turned it in be well before then. But um, everyone's still gonna be due at the same time, right? And so in a proposal, the main thing you wanna convey is what's the generator gonna do? Like what problem is it solving? How might somebody uh, interface with this generator's output? What sort of parameters are gonna be in this generator? And it's a good project will have something that has some amount of depth to it in terms of, uh, if it's one module, which is, you know, very fixed function and has no knobs, that's not necessarily a great opportunity for this class, but it's some amount of parameterization, some amount of ability to parameterize what you're doing, that's what we want to have for these generators, right? So we really understand this parameterized ability in a generation may not just be, um, for solving the problem, may you know not do different problem sizes. It could also be the fact that, you know, under the hood, you may do different optimization techniques or things to kind of play with that kind of stuff. And in proposal, you should definitely consider not just, you know, the problem you're solving, the interface, the parameters, but also kind of pitch how you're gonna have a roadmap, right? How you're gonna do this, right? How, what's the smallest, simplest thing you can build first to get going? Uh, and then how you're gonna go ahead and add features on, what are you gonna add features on? Remember, of course, you can change that as you go, but it's good to have a plan in the beginning. Uh, as an intermediate checkpoint, we are gonna ask you share with instructional staff a link to a repo 
with enough instructions for us to clone it and run some test cases on your design. Your design is not maybe feature complete at this point, but just to prove to us, you know, yes, you've closed the loop, you have some stuff running through tools, you have some simulations running and some things are working. That's what you need to show to us there. Um, and then of course you're gonna present in the final week. Uh, and then following the presentation, you're gonna have a little bit of time to do any last polish, but perhaps you've, perhaps you've hopefully uh, done it well before then. And then um, the final, final deliverable will be a link to the repo uh, the, which you've made, as well as um, the uh, presentation slide which you may revise, right? So in terms of documenting what you've done, uh, there's gonna be documentation in the repo for using the repo and interfacing with it. And there's also gonna be your presentation slides which you can turn as a PDF. Uh, they're gonna kind of be the way for us to kind of after the fact go back and see what's going on. Now in terms of uh, this content, uh, what's going to be public versus private. Uh, you know, as students, all of your stuff by default is private, uh, but you can choose to make it public, especially because you're doing unique assignments. There's no worry about people copying or anything. So uh, we'd like to encourage you, but we're not, obviously it can't require you to make this public, right? So uh, your repo, for example, when you share it with us, if you don't make that public, that's fine. You can, you know, add our instructor accounts to it so we can see it, but then it's still a private repo to you and your partner. But, you know, once again, we encourage you to make it public, kind of, you know, put things out into the world and show here's more things for chill the community. Same thing goes for presentations where uh, groups, if they would like to have their presentation recorded and put on the site uh, playlist, more than welcome to. Uh, but if that's something that seems a little nervous and they don't want to, they can opt out of that. Cool, okay, as a quick dump, I kind of raced through all the project details before I want to take any questions on it. So now I'll take questions on a project uh, if there are any. Okay, uh, any questions on the project? As I said, we have this week's homework in lab and there'll be one more homework in lab. We'll probably push the deadlines out farther because there's not anything else kind of pushing it back, but um, hopefully next week's homework will be easier than this week's homework. Cool, if there's no more questions for me, I'll go ahead and stop the recording and uh, sign off and let Jason hold office hours in this Zoom call. Uh, 